this being the center uh, axis of rotation. Now when you, why, why is there so many sirens? It's not necessary. Well, there's a fire brigade there now. Someone fell in, the, there was a pan pan on the radio, someone fell in the water over here. Um, they got out fine, but there's now an ambulance, two ambulance, and a fire, a massive fire engine is now here. Oh, another ambulance. Oh no, it's a fire, it's a fire truck. Not sure what happened. Pretty sure the guy's not on fire, but. <laughs> G'day, Justin here. When we transitioned from our land life to our full-time liveaboard cruising life, there are numerous videos that really aided that transition, specifically those that dealt with uh, the maintenance on the boat and how to do this maintenance yourself. And there are a lot of jobs on the boat that you can do yourself. So in that spirit, this video is really about uh, how to do the injector servicing on a Volvo Penta D240 engine. Now by servicing, what I really mean is how to pull the injectors out and then how to reinstall them. We had the servicing done by a local uh, diesel workshop. And by walking you through it, hopefully you'll see that if even a numpty like me can do it, then you could probably do it too. All you need is just a few tools, a little bit of patience, uh, and be folded like a pretzel to get into the workspace. Actually, that's the hardest bit is getting into the workspace. The actual task itself is just undoing some nuts and then redoing those nuts back up. It's not that difficult. All right, with that said, uh, let's jump into what tools we need and I'll get a new shirt on and we'll get started. Pause the video if you want to read through all that. Otherwise, let's get started. Okay, so you want to start by switching off the electrical circuit and closing the valves for the fuel supply and fuel return hoses. Then we can remove the fuel return hose from the fuel return pipe. Shove a little bit of uh, fuel absorbent cloth in there just to catch the drips. And then you can empty the fuel return hose into the jar. I'll demonstrate it here like a pro. Oh, look at it. Butterfingers. It's all going to shit. What an idiot. Okay, then chuck a rubber finger over the end of the fuel return hose and then we can disconnect the fuel supply hose from the banjo nipple on the injection pump. Just dump that in the jar, whack it off and then cover it with a rubber johnny. Also cover the banjo nipple with a rubber finger. Now we can remove the clamps from the fuel supply pipes and then remove the fuel supply pipes. I started by just cracking the nuts on each end so that they were finger tight and then uh, undid them completely and lift the rail off all in one go. This will reduce the chance of bending the pipes. Cover each end of the pipe with a rubber finger as well as the ports on the injection pump. Now I ran into a bit of a problem here, it's difficult to see but the fuel supply pipe here is actually being bent. I actually mentioned it earlier. This fuel line's been bent before. What I think that's happened is that the nut on the injection pump and the nut on the fuel supply pipe have become come seized together. So here I am counter holding uh, the pair of them and trying to give them some curry. Ah, no job. On a boat goes unpunished. I should have got a bigger shifter. One more time with passion and <sighs> golden. Bob's your uncle. Okay, with the fuel supply pipes off, you can remove the fuel return pipe. To do this, you need to remove the retaining nut on top of the injector, and you'll need to counter hold the injector itself so as to not bend the fuel return pipe. Then you wanna remove the screw on the banjo nipple. This is where those gaskets will be replaced on reassembly. Once the fuel return pipe is off, put that screw back into the banjo nipple just to seal up the fuel system and stop any contamination. With that all out of the way, you can get access to the injectors and give it a good clean before you start pulling those injectors out. This will stop anything falling into the injector ports. There's nothing for it at this point. Next thing to do is just grab the big spanner and give it some love. Come on. There we go. So this looks like it had some anti-seize on there. Not sure what type, it's probably a copper copper grease or something. These ones don't look as bad as the other side. 
once the injector's out, I had a good look in there just to make sure nothing's fallen in, and then clean out the injector port. I used the uh, lint-free cotton cloth, which happened to be a piece of pillowcase, but we won't tell Laura that. I dipped the end in a little bit of diesel, and that way any debris or swarf will stick to the end of the cloth and you'll be able to clean the port out. Having diesel this close to your face is a joy. Oh. Once it was sufficiently clean, I grab a clean piece of pillowcase and basically shove it in the hole and that'll stay there until uh, the injectors are ready to go back in. Crush washer on the end. Now on both cylinder one and cylinder two, the crush washer or the gasket, whatever you want to call it, the yeah, copper washer, the stayed on the injector. But on cylinders three and four, the uh, gasket ended up staying in the injector port. So you just need to get in there with a screwdriver and gently pry it out. Just lean on it. Come on. And last one and we're home and hosed. Let's see if we can... And that's what it looks like inside an injector port. Amazing. Job done. Well, half done. Oh no, our horns are going. This is such a noisy location. <laughs> okay, before we start the reassembly or the assembly or putting the thing back together. Before we start that, I have a quick note on using a torque wrench uh, with a crow's foot adapter or any other adapter uh, which offsets the axis of rotation. Now you're probably familiar with using a torque wrench. Uh, essentially it's a device that allows you to dial in the specified torque for the fastener that you're working with. And it, when you reach that torque on the fastener, it gives you a nice nice little click which is great for gorilla hands like me when I just, I just yank down on them until they break off, basically. Now, I know that sounds like a bit of hyperbole, a bit of exaggeration, but look at this knucklehead. Just grabs the soccer wrench and goes to town on it with expected results. Oh, you gotta be f kidding me. F f that was a $30 error just there. Oh well. This thing tells me I've reached the required torque. Do that all day. The, the torque wrench is calibrated based on this lever length to this point being the axis of rotation. Now when you add a crow's foot attachment to this, and if you're going to use the crow's foot so it's in line uh, with the torque wrench itself, you've just extended the lever length because the new axis of rotation is now here, which is the center of the crow's foot. So the distance between the center of the crow's foot and the calibrated uh, axis of rotation increases the lever length on this device by about 20%. So that means you're effectively going to be torquing at 20% greater than your input. So if you put in 10 Newton meters of force at this end, which is calibrated for this point, at this end you're going to end up getting 12 Newton meters of torque. And now there are formulas that usually come in the instructions for the device which will uh, tell you how to calculate the input torque that you need to put in for a given length of lever if you're using a crow's foot attachment or another attachment which shifts your axis of rotation. However, rather than calculating what the input needs to be if you're keeping the crow's foot head out in front like this, uh, the simplest thing to do is just to position the head at 90 degrees to the torque wrench itself, the lever length from the calibrated axis of rotation to the handle is going to be the same lever length from the handle to the axis of rotation on the crow's foot. So they're gonna be identical. Uh, you ensure that the input torque that you put in at this end will be exactly what you're getting here. As simple as that. All right, let's fix the job. Once you get your injectors back, just check a couple of things first. You should have two new washers on here. These are gaskets. The bottom one uh, doesn't have any holes in it and the top one will have a hole. So those two holes allow fuel to come back from the injector back up the fuel return rail. So make sure that's on there. You also need to make sure you've got this nut, the retaining nut. We're going to leave the retaining nut off for now and just pop the cover back onto it to keep it from getting contaminated. And on the other end we'll have the nozzle don't mess around with that, obviously. And we'll take the uh, bottom gasket off, which goes into the injector port, and we'll put the cap back on. 
All right, now let's get the thing back together. Essentially, you're gonna be doing everything in reverse order as when you uh, pulled it apart. Start by removing one of the pieces of the cloth from the injector port, drop the gasket over the end of a screwdriver and then just poke the screwdriver in the hole and drop the gasket into the injector port so that it's flush at the bottom. Then you need to apply sealant to the bottom two threads on the injector itself. The sealant is Loctite 574. Interestingly, the D240 manual calls for this sealant, but the manual for the Volvo Penta D255 doesn't require it. It's probably just being used here as an anti-seize, and I apply it simply because the workshop manual called for it. That's just a matter of popping the cap off and screwing it into the hole. I screw it in just so it's finger tight here and worry about talking once they're all in place. Look at this. What's wrong with this picture? It's unbelievable how long he tries at this before realising something's wrong. It's hard to believe he's got a PhD. What an idiot. Helps if you take this part off. Oh goodness. And it's rinse and repeat basically. Now I have a little bit of problem here with the torque wrench, or more specifically the crow's foot, the large crow's foot. You'll see here that it just slides straight off. What ha what's going on is that the engine itself, as the crow's foot would twist, it would just be pushing against the engine and pushing it back off the uh, injector nut. So what I was doing was changing to the smaller crow's foot attachment, uh, tightening up with the injector holder, and then getting the injector nut lined up so I could torque on it properly. Once all the injectors are in place and torqued, then it's time to install the fuel return rail. Remove the screw from the banjo nipple. This is where your two gaskets will be required. So you'll have the screw, a gasket, the fuel return rail, and then another gasket. Remove the caps from the top of the injectors and slide it all into place and then finger tight the uh, screw back into that banjo nipple. Uh, you'll notice I put the caps on all the time and that's just to stop any contamination getting into the fuel system. Then just put the retaining nuts back onto the top of the injectors and then you're ready to torque on those. Again, you'll have to counter hold the injector when you torque on the retaining nut. The manual doesn't specify the torque required for these retaining nuts, but I assume that it was the same as the injectors themselves. And this makes sense given the assembly. And then of course use a torque wrench to tighten up the <laughs> screw in the banjo nipple. There's no torque specification for that screw. However, I went with 10 Newton meters, which is the general guide. It's a 10. Then I replace the fuel return hose onto the fuel return rail and then replace the fuel supply hose onto the banjo nipple itself. Now it's time to reinstall the fuel supply pipes. The fuel supply pipes get torqued to 12 Newton meters. And again, it's just a matter of putting the fuel supply pipe on, spinning the nuts down so that it's even pressure on the top and bottom and then going through the final torquing. Okay, back together. And once that's back in place, you re return the fuel supply pipe clamps, and you're pretty much done. Turn back on the fuel supply and fuel return valves, and turn the electrical circuit on. Before starting the engine, you'll need to bleed it. So you essentially just bleed it the same way as you do when you do a fuel filter change. And start kicking it over, you'll... Yeah, again. You'll find it'll seconds. take a number of attempts to get the actual engine running, and that's just because fuel's getting back up into again, the system. Three seconds. And you want to start checking for any fuel leaks at this point in time. That's good. Of course, once you get the engine running as well, you'll obviously need to uh, do a final check on fuel leaks. Right, we're done. It's not a greatly difficult job. Anyone can pretty much do it. And by doing it yourself, you're gonna save yourself a few hundred quid. Well, I hope you found this useful. Any questions, stick them in the comments.